Because in the end, what I'm trying to do here is to figure out with you, how do we feel good, okay? If drinking 10 beers a day made me feel good all the time, that's what I'd be doing, okay? No problem, okay? The problem with drinking 10 beers a day is it doesn't work. Eventually it catches up and you don't feel good and that's the problem. So if I could do it and it felt good all the time, I'd be the first one to do it. So this is what we're trying to figure out is what feels good and what reduces suffering or stress on our, both our body and our minds. Okay, so sleep is huge. You cannot be, you know, you know you're not healthy, excuse me, <clears throat> not feeling super healthy and you go to see your doctor, I'm tired all the time, you know, maybe something's wrong in my blood, maybe my iron's low. Well, what are you sleeping at night? Well, I go to bed at 2 in the morning after watching some TV for two hours. I'm like, well, I don't think it's your iron, okay? So a lot of the biz things about health is good daily habits. This is the business that I'm in. I try to persuade people to adopt healthy day-to-day -day habits. It's as simple as my job gets. I'd like to sound more sophisticated and make you think I'm really smart and know all these special things, but really, I just try to tell people Get your sleep, eat your food right, get a bit of exercise. Because in the end, that's what's going to make you healthy. Not your doctor, not some health promoter who's going to say this specific thing is going to make you crazy healthy. It's good daily habits and taking care of those basics that we've been telling our children to do. We've got to make sure we do it for ourselves. Um, so nutrition, nutrition, exercise, social time. They've shown this in all the studies. We're all social beings. We're social animals. We need regular social interactions and not just with your spouses, although that's okay too. <laughs> you want to have some time with friends, uh, extended family, regular social time they've shown in studies helps to promote happy hormones in your brains to get released. So that friend you haven't, you've been putting off calling, call them up, go have a coffee, go have a tea. Go play a round of golf in Chaplow. <laughs> come, on, come on over. So social time is just a, one of those basic things that we, oversee, we overlook sometimes, but is extremely important for our health. So a bit of social time. I threw in here forgiveness, okay? There's actually been a lot of studies in the last 10 years about forgiveness. Apparently, it's really good for you. Who would have known? But... So sometimes people will say, oh, I can never forgive this person for what they did to me 10 years ago. Like, well, that was 10 years ago. And today you're still stressed out about it. Or you're not letting it go. And it's not healthy for you. So when we forgive, we forgive for ourselves. We forgive for our own well-being. So if there's somebody in your life that maybe you're still holding on to that, oh, I can't believe they did that to me 20 years ago, Maybe it's time to let it go and enjoy the benefits of that. Because when you really let it go and say, you know what, it was 20 years ago, it has nothing to do with today, sometimes we feel better. Because in the end, it's all about feeling good. This is what we're here to talk about. How do we feel as good as we can, as consistently as we can, from day to day? Okay? So that's sort of my little round of our players of, uh, of team health. So every player counts. No one player can win the game on their own. You need the whole team to be in on it to win. And that's the whole thing about health. Every aspect kind of has to participate to enjoy that vibrant health of feeling light on your feet and enjoying your day and getting your stuff done and meeting up with people and enjoying how, how life moves through your, through your day to day. But I want to I wanna introduce a new player that's very important and very not well understood or recognized yet. And this is cognitive exercise, okay? Cognitive exercise is absolutely essential to our well-being, to bring up our well-being from here to here. And we're gonna go into details of that, so I'm gonna do some drawings now. And I warn you, I am not an artist at all. But we're gonna just jump right in because in the end, What's happening in your brain is huge in terms of the impact on your health, even your physiology. We know this for a fact that when you're stressed, your mind is stressed, your adrenal glands release cortisone into your bloodstream, and that tightens your vessels. It tightens your stomach. Uh, it does, 
it actually speeds up your heart rate faster than it should be. Now, you know, 5,000 years ago, all of a sudden there's a lion about to chase me or a bear. That good shot of cortisone in my body is good because I'm going to run a little extra fast and I'm going to be a little extra stronger for the next 10 minutes while I figure out how to save my life. So evolutionary, cortisone is excellent. That fight or flight response is how they say it. But what happens is that today in the society that we live in, for most of us, we do have a cop here that may be exposed to actual life-threatening situations, but for most of us, we're not exposed to life-threatening situations on a day-to-day -day basis. But we imagine the lions in our head. Our bank account is the lion. What he, said, what he said, she said is the lion that scares us. We frighten ourselves with imaginary scenarios. And so we release that cortisone into our body in smaller amounts, that have no use at that point. It just tightens your body, tightens your stomach, reduces your digestion, reduces your immune system. So sometimes when people come to me, you know, I, can't, I, I keep getting sick every month, I don't know what's going on, and then I ask them about their stress, sometimes they'll say, well, I'm not, imaginary. I, I'm not imagining it, Guillaume. I'm like, I know you're not. I know you're actually sick right now. I know you're not feeling well. But you have to still understand that being stressed all the time will have an impact on your, your immune system. You will have more trouble fighting off bugs because you're more stressed. Okay? So let's, we're going to show you a bit of a map of how it looks like in your brain. Okay? So I'm going to do... If, if anybody can see, I welcome you to come a little bit more to the front. Okay? So you'll have to bear with my artistic ability. You're like a crow flying over somebody's head. Can everybody picture that? You got the ears, the eyes, and the nose. <laughs> it's as good as it gets, folks, okay? So you're just going to have to... Okay? And... <laughs> yeah, so, so you're flying. So you're flying over somebody's head, and you're seeing it from the top, okay? And this is, no, this is not anything quacky I'm about to present. These are studies coming out of Harvard, Yale, in the most prestigious universities in the United States. It's coming out of China. It's coming out all over the world with sophisticated um, functional MRI machines, like the kind of MRI that maybe some of you have participated in where they check your shoulder, they check your brain, they check your back, they check your spine, except they actually look at the brain activity. And they've been doing this for about 10, 15 years now. Lots and lots of good papers coming out on this whole subject. And I'm going to talk about two main things. There's a, there's, a set, there's a network in our brain, two centers mostly, deep in the middle of our brain, that fire signals back and forth. And this they call, sorry, default, I should have wrote that down before, <laughs> mode network. Default mode network is what the scientists call this. And what the default mode network is, is the voice in your head. Have any, anybody noticed that they have a voice in their head? <laughs> Am I the only one that has one? No. <laughs> that chatter, that endless chatter in your brain. Everybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no? <laughs> we have a very, very peaceful cop here because he doesn't have any voice in his head, so. <laughs> I've got several. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I have more than one, too. Um, so, this is actually, they can see it now. Now, there's more sub networks to this, so I've simplified for my own understanding, too, uh, this network, but really, essentially, there's two main centers that go back and forth and send neural signals back and forth. So they'll take somebody who says, yeah, I can't stop thinking about this problem in my head, and they'll stick him in this MRI machine, and they can see activity right over here. Da, 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 da. So there's different characteristics of this network. Um, they call it self-talk. There's non-practical future past talk. Anybody have that? <laughs> I think all of us do that. So this is the thing. This network 
is an old useless network in our brain, okay, that actually needs to operate at a much lower level. Probably 10% of most of what the average person operates at. So, for example, if you notice your day-to-day, -day, how many of your thoughts are actually practical and useful in a day-to-day -day basis? I, I encourage you to experiment with that once you leave here, to observe your thoughts. Which one's actually useful? When you're thinking about the past or the future, which ones of them is actually handy to think about? Probably max 5 to 10%, maximum. They say today the average person has 50,000 thoughts a day. 50,000 thoughts a day. No wonder mental health is a huge issue in our society these days. Yeah. And this is not, talk I'm not talking about schizophrenia, bipolar disease, those sort of more pathological problems. I'm talking about the average person like you and I that thinks all day long in a pretty much useless fashion. Now, yes, there is a small percentage of that that's like, hmm, yes, my husband and I want to go to Cuba in three months. I'm going to go online. I'm going to book the date. I'm going to go on my calendar. I'm going to write it down. Sure. Yeah, that's handy. That's practical. It's a bit of self-taught. That's useful. Or, you know, that website, last time I used it in the past, didn't work well, so I won't use it again. Okay. Okay. That's useful, sure. And then there's all the rest of this stuff. I was born this way and I had this childhood and I was raised this way and I had this problem and I have this problem because I had this kind of mother and I had this sort of father and this is who I am. And in the future, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. I don't know what's, you know, like, I'm gonna have to talk to this person, it's gonna be terrible. Or great, I can't wait to be in the future because now it sucks. So there's a lot of this stuff happening in our brain that is not good. And in fact, when this thing is operating, there's, they've measured that people have higher levels of cortisone in their body. So typically, if this thing's firing off, you're probably more stressed. And people who have, and I'm not talking about our audience necessarily here, but just for the fact of understanding this network, when people have major depression, so severe depression that's been lasting a year, two years of this very deep depression, and they've studied their brains, this network is firing off like crazy. Okay? I'm going to show you a different network. There's a different network. Sorry, three, three main centers to this one. That's been also well mapped out and pretty well understood. And this one they call, I'm gonna write it somewhere else. Sorry for those who can't read this. Task positive network. Task positive network, TPN. And what they found, so let me ask you a question, okay? Has anybody observed in their life a moment when they're very concentrated on a task? Whether you're a woodworker, whether you're working on a pipe in your house, whether you're just doing the job that you do every day, and for about one hour, or not even, 20 minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, in your task, you're just doing your job. And there's no voice in your head. You're just doing your job in front of you. It could be anything. It could be complicated stuff, it could be simple stuff, but you're just there. Has anybody noticed that if they're doing something very specific that they, don't, they notice there's no actual voice in their head? Does that match some of your experiences? And then you finish your job and you go to lunch. It comes back online. Does that match some of your experiences? Am I way off here or do some people agree here? So what happened neuro, neurocognitively from an neuroanatomy point of view is that when you were doing your task your brain switched to this network Doop. and your brain's firing off here and it feels good to be here because there's no voice in your head and in fact they find out that when people's brain predominantly works here there's more endorphins in their body endorphin is a chemical it's like morphine except your body makes it feels really good <laughs> or endorphins you know and they're, they're legal Okay, um, there's serotonin, 
dopamine. Those are chemicals that your brain makes that gives you that happy vibe, okay? And when you're here, it feels better. And then you finish your job, whoop, and your brain defaults back to the default mode. It goes whoop, back onto the default mode. Da, 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 da. And so your life is kind of a switching back and forth. And some people will say, gosh, I really enjoy my work. I, I just want to go back to work. I love work. You know, even workaholics can't get away from work because when they're at work, they're focused on their job. They're focused on their job. They're focused on their job. And there's no voice in their head. They're just doing what they have to do. And then they get home to their wife and kids and the brain switches back to the default mode network. Oh, oh my voice. Oh, I, can't, I don't like it here. I want to go back to work. You know, <laughs> and they think that the work is what they enjoy, but what they're really enjoying is the brain state or this brain network that's operating. Same thing, for example, thrill seekers, you know, those guys who ski in Whistler with those crazy steep mountains and any wrong move and they die, you know, they have to be super concentrated not to die. And so when they're not doing that, they're right over here and the brain is very active on the task positive network because they have to be super concentrated. And then they, oh, that was so, I felt so alive on the mountain, right? It's the mountain that makes me feel alive. And they come home to their girlfriend and then same thing. Whoop, goes back, da, da, da. Oh, I need to go back to the mountain because that's where I feel good. But it's because this is what they're enjoying, okay? Another interesting thing about this. There's a gentleman, and actually I will talk about him, but Gary Weber, I talked about, I thanked on my previous a few minutes ago, uh, is an interesting guy. He, he worked his brain through different cognitive exercises for about 30 years, many hours a day, two hours a day in the morning. And this guy's a regular guy, raised a family, had two kids, was in the military, had a corporate job, a wife, regular dude. And then when he got later in life, 60s, 70s, I forget, I don't know how old he is, he described that he feels, feels pretty much good all the time. And, his and the voice in his head is pretty much gone. Maybe like a little 10% of his day has a bit of a voice, but most of the time it's just quiet in his head. Just walks around, and he's completely functional. You can email this guy, and he's a regular guy. And they stuck him in this machine, in the MRI machine, and he has barely any activity here. And there's more and more studies now that are coming out all over the world. There's one that I just found a couple weeks ago from China. The less activity there is here, the more your brain's happy. The more you report happiness. Uh, like, so they'll take people and say, okay, so tell me how happy you are. Be honest, you know, and they'll do hundreds of subjects. And they'll narrow them down to maybe 30, 40 <laughs> subjects. By subjects, I mean people they're studying. And they'll, you know, describe happiness. And those that are describing pretty, pretty happy lives, and it's not based on money, it's not how much money they have. It's not necessarily having the perfect cookie cutter house and perfect family. But they'll say, yeah, I feel pretty good. I'm a pretty happy person. And they'll stick them on the machine and there's not that much activity. And those that are very unhappy, lots of activity here. So this is a network that may have been useful in our brain's evolutionary at some point. But it's a bit outdated now, but we haven't been taught this. In fact, when we're kids, we're taught by our parents and our school system and in the whole thing with the Industrial Revolution, think. You need to think. It's good to think. Think about it. Well, a little bit of thinking is good, not too much thinking. Okay? Thinking less can produce more solutions. In fact, let's say, for example, there's three, there's three choices in your life. This is another thing that stresses people out. What choice am I going to make? What am I going to do with my decision? My daughter wants to go to a college in the Sioux or Sudbury or Timmins, and I don't know which one I should talk to her about going, for example. Okay? So you got decisions to make, and you're, you're stressed about your decision, so you're thinking about it all day long, even though you're not coming up with a solution. So your brain actually, what's actually happening, so your brain needs to absorb the information. So yes, you need to read the pamphlets, you need to talk about the university and, or the college, and. Okay, these are my options, sure. And, you know, acquire the information. Very useful thing, right? We need to read up on it. So your frontal lobe will start to process this information. And then it'll kind of keep, they'll show the brain operating here and then operating here. And then eventually the back of your brain will light up 
And that's when we know that the brain has made up the, their mind. You know what, daughter of mine, beautiful daughter of mine, I think you should go to university C. But in the meantime, the problem with that is that this part of your brain is saying, oh, I don't know which one she should go to. You're talking to yourself the whole time, whereas this part of your brain has nothing to do with the decision your brain is going to make. In fact, it's getting in the way. So good decisions are made with a quieter mind, not a more busy mind. Because your brain's gonna make that process anyway happen, and this is just getting in the way. Because it's sucking all the energy, or all the neural connections, away from the other parts of your brain that are actually useful in getting things done, making decisions, processing information that you've just read, or learned. Are we good so far? So, what we're here to talk about today is how do we reduce this? How do we get into the... Because this is not a magic thing where, where we're just like, oh, well, I'm I just going to stop it. It's like, no, no, no. This is like a muscle. It's, it behaves exactly like a muscle. They have a bunch, a bunch of studies where they made people do certain mental exercises, and they scan their brains about eight weeks later. And there's lots of reduced activity and more activity here. You know, sometimes I've told people about cognitive exercises or the scary word meditation, which I'm going to talk about is a big problem as a word because people, I'm not a spiritual guy, I'm not a religious guy, person, so I don't want to talk about that. Well, it's not really meditation like I'm going to go to the fifth dimension here and, you know, it's about working your brain in a very specific fashion. And when you work that brain in a specific fashion, it learns to go here, and it can learn this, by the way, at any age, and that we know. The brain is extremely plastic. By plastic, it means it can remold itself, reshape itself. So it's not something they used to think, that by the time you're about my age, that's it. That's it, that's what your brain is, this is the brain you have, it's over, good luck with that brain that you're gonna have the rest of your life. Good job. Kind of a depressing thing, actually. But what they found out in the la and this is, you know, <clears throat> Very clear to all brain scientists, this is not true. The brain can reformat itself at any stage of life. So we need to teach the brain to wire itself more here, more here, okay? And I'm gonna give you three examples of exercises today, and they're not the only ones. So don't be, if you figure something else out, that's it. But the idea is to slow down the thinking in your head. The narrative, that's the whole point. And if there's other ways you can figure that out, great. But I'll give you three examples, okay? One of them is, very simple, if you're walking towards your car, or you're walking outside, pay really close attention to the sensation of your footsteps. Concentrate on your footsteps, just... Those are my footsteps, hey, my feet, okay, my feet. But you'll notice by the time you get to your car, you haven't been thinking about anything. I'll give you another one. In this, I'm going to get everybody to sit down with their back straight and their feet on the ground. Can everybody do this for me? Okay. Very simple. We're going to take, in a moment, a big breath all together. So a big breath in and a big breath out. And you're going to focus as much as you can, like a cat that's watching a mouse hole. Very concentrated on the physical sensation of your nostrils. That's it. Just focus with all your brain power onto the physical sensation of the air moving in and out of your nostrils. One deep breath altogether. Open your eyes. Any thoughts in the last 10 seconds? Did people notice that in the last 10 seconds, there was no voice, no narrative? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> well, yeah, sometimes you might get a little visual or something. That's, that's normal. <laughs> so, uh, notice how you had about 10 seconds, no thinking. And this is a good starter. You can do this exercise sitting on the bathroom, Having a pee, you sit down, just breathe, okay? Don't think. Okay, you're, you get in the car before taking off, just take a breath. 
it usually seems to have an effect on your brain if you do this for about 10, 15 times a day. One big breath, a couple times at a time. And what happened there when we took that breath is just for a few seconds, this shut down and this came online. Because we were focused, we were concentrated, our mind wasn't wandering. Mind wandering is another characteristic of this. Rumination. Does everybody know the word rumination? To repeatedly think of the same thing over and over and over in your head and obsessing. I can't believe that person said that. I can't believe that person said that. I can't believe that person said that. I should have said this. I should have said this. I should have said this. Ruminating. Very unhealthy for our brain. Because this is what's happening. It's going over here. Stress hormones. Tighten your blood vessels. Poor digestion. Lower immune system. Okay? So when you did the breathing, you went here. And so it's nothing magical. If I call it a meditation, everyone's like, oh, meditation, spirituality, no, thank you. It's not a meditation. It's a cognitive brain exercise. So your brain can be healthy. You know, the do you go to the doctor and they say, you know, the World Health Organization recommends you do about 150 minutes a week of moderate physical exercise to stay healthy, to promote health. Everybody should do 150 minutes. But nobody talks about, well, maybe you should also exercise your brain to promote your mental health. I'm not talking about just avoiding problems, but your mental health is here, you're pretty good, but you still stress about quite a few things. Let's go here. Let's go here where there's even less stress and even life is more fun, okay? So it's about exercising your brain. And that's the other thing. Sometimes I'll have a quick talk with a patient about meditation. You know what, Guillaume? Can't do it. I cannot meditate. Just can't do it. I sit down and I breathe and then my mind goes off. I can't do it. I'm like, of course you can. Because this is a new muscle. You know, somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I want to learn to do push-ups. I can't do push-ups. I'm like, okay, so here, you're going to work your triceps this way for about a week. And then after a week, you're going to try to do one kind of push-ups with your knees. And then after a week of doing one push-up, you're going to try to do two. And when you get to 10 push-ups on your knees, you're going to get to one push-up on your arms. And then next thing you know, six months later, they can do 10 push-ups straight. Nothing magical. Nothing miraculous, because they work their muscles. It's the same thing. This is a muscle in your brain that must be trained. It must be exercised for it to become more dominant, to access those happy chemicals, to access the happy morphine that's actually your body makes by itself. Okay? So it does take repetition. It's not like, Guillaume told me to do this breath. I'm perfect now. I made it, guys. I'm completely without stress. It's like, no, you got to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And the other thing I'm going to say about this is this is not a process that ends. Okay, guys, I've been uh, doing Guillaume's exercise for about a month. It's been pretty good, and I'm done now. There's no end to this. It's like asking, when do you stop eating fruits and vegetables in your life? When do you stop sleeping eight hours a night? You know, I'm seven years old. I'm 70 years old. I've been eating fruits and veggies for 68 years. I'm done. I've done it. I've put in my job. I'm finished. Okay? And then, to about a year later, I've got constipation issues and I've got this problem because you stopped the good habit. This is about forming. I'm encouraging you guys today to develop a new habit that you integrate into your daily lives which is to stop that mental chatter on a regular, consistent basis. Number two, we're going to go quick. I know I'm using a little extra time, but we're going to keep going. <laughs> uh, here we go. <clears throat> thinking, this is a big one too, guys. Thinking about... does not equal thinking through. Okay? This is another good one to use because sometimes something in your day is bothering you. There's something on your mind that you just can't stop thinking about because it's bugging you. And then you try my breathing thing, not mine, but the breathing thing, and yeah, it's not working. I'm just still thinking about this thing way too much. That breathing technique is thing. So what you do is, you take a piece of paper, you sit down, 
and you think your problem through. Three to five minutes with a piece of paper, you think it through. Because you're exercising a different part of your brain at that point. When you're thinking through on paper, you're here. When you're thinking about, I don't know what I'm going to do about this problem. I should do this, I should do that, I should do this, I should do that. You're here. And you're not going to solve anything being here. Make sense? So thinking through with a piece of paper, maybe once a day, three to five minutes in the evening, piece of paper, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this person tomorrow. There's the pros and cons of choosing option A or this. You're actually, you're, you're, you're focused. You're thinking things through. It's not the same as thinking about. Thinking about is you're not going to get anywhere productive. You're just going to think of more problems. But if you actually want the solution, think it through. Very different brain centers, very different brain patterns, and very much less efficient at coming up with solutions. Okay? How are we doing on time? Time to wrap it up. Okay. Um, I won't go with the third exercise because that would take another ten minutes to explain. Okay. Um, but what I mean, but just to finish up, guys, uh, this player in the team of health uh, is not well understood these days. Cognitive exercises are a huge part of your health. Because when you learn to think less, use less narrative in your mind, your immune system goes up, it gives you a better chance at better heart health, it will affect your physiology. And, so the physiology is a, is a bonus side effect kind of thing. The real benefit is that you feel good inside. It feels nice to have quietness. But it is a habit forming thing. You have to form slowly into your lives to take the habit of reducing your thinking on a regular basis, to interrupt it with just a bit of quietness through the nose, thinking things through, paying attention to your footsteps. If you're cleaning, just clean. Focus on your movements. Don't think about everything else while you're cleaning. Just clean. Be quiet in your mind while you're cleaning. Okay? Thank you. Is there any questions? What happens when you have a song in your head and you can't get rid of it? <laughs> 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 yeah. okay. Has anybody ever been through that? Yes. Yeah. Well, sometimes I, I say to my wife, want to know what's in my head? I can give it to you. <laughs> yeah. And it works. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's a tricky one. There's, there's, they've talked about that one too, of uh, different strategies. Um, I'll give, you, I'll give you one, actually, we'll go, we'll go quickly into the one thing, but I'll, I won't go into the whole detail of the third the exercise. Version, not the long I'll give you the short version. <laughs> Try it for me, okay? Yeah, Use different sounds, okay? Because it does exercise your brain in a different way. So you've got uh, CCR, have you ever seen the rain stuck in your head over and over again, and you're tired of hearing CCR? Yeah. Sata nama. You don't, I, I'm not even going to say what those words mean, okay? Okay, you've been, the freaking song is non-stop. Then you're walking to your car, sata nama, sata nama, sata nama, and just repeat it over and over and over again. Because when you're doing that, when you're deliberately repeating a certain sound, you're exercising that different part of your brain. The task positive network I was talking about. So that's one strategy. Sometimes you just gotta let it be till it goes away. <laughs> I, tried, I tried humming a different sound. Yeah. That okay. <laughs> well, if I get invited here next year, <laughs> tell me how it worked with this experiment. Just use it as an experiment. Go for about three minutes and repeat to your mind, Sata Nama, Sata Nama. That sounds like I should be in church. Yeah, well, there's a reason why those sounds exist in a lot of religious circles, but I'm not here to get religious. Yeah, because this exercise that I was going to mention, which we can go at another presentation, we can focus on this one, but just to say, the, the, found, the Alzheimer's Society funded a study for people who had very mild uh, memory impairment and low mood. And there's, another, there's more detail to this exercise besides the sounds, but they made people do this exercise 12 minutes a day for eight weeks. And then their memory got better and their mood got better. So I am not here to promote religion. I am here to promote your brain feeling good. 